Hey, Mr. Scott here again. Uh, we're just going to go over chapter number seven in this video. It's on absolute value and reciprocal functions. I'm not going to do every question. I'll just do a select few questions here, but just a reminder, only watch this video if you've actually given some of these questions a try. I don't want you just watching this video and think you can learn uh, Math 20 curriculum that way. I want you actually to be giving these a try, so make sure you've at least tried all these questions before you watch this video. So the first question we're going to do is question number 1C. It says evaluate. We have 3 times the absolute value of negative 2 minus 4 times the absolute value of negative 2. Well just remember, absolute value turns whatever is inside the absolute value into a positive number. So if we have 3 times the absolute value of negative 2 minus 4 times the absolute value of negative 2, we just have to take the absolute value of the negative 2 here and the negative 2 here first. Kind of treat these absolute value bars as if they are like brackets when we do order of operations. So this is going to become 3 times absolute value of negative 2, which is positive 2, minus 4 times the absolute value of negative 2, which is positive 2. So this, of course, becomes 3 times 2, which is 6, minus 4 times 2, which is 8, which gives us a final answer of negative 2. So the next one we're going to do here is question 2a. It says solve absolute value of 3x equals 9. Um, just a reminder, again, absolute value makes whatever's inside of it positive. So this 3x that we have right here, that 3x very well could have been positive 9, but the 3x inside the absolute value bars there could have also have been negative 9, because the absolute value of negative 9 would still give you positive 9. So we have to take account for this. We'll say it's 3x equals 9, but we'll also say that it could be 3x equals negative 9. So this is making two separate equations that we're going to have to solve and see if we get the right answer. So 3x is 9, that just means x would be equal to positive 3. And 3x is negative 9, that would just mean x is equal to negative 3. Now just remember, with absolute value problems, my rule was you absolutely must check to see if the answers are actually true. So in other words, we need to take these two x's we got and plug them into the original equation we were given. So in other words, we need to try both of them in the equation absolute value of 3x equals positive 9. Well, if you plug x is 3 into this, we're going to get the absolute value of 3 times 3, which is, in other words, the absolute value of 3 times 3 is the absolute value of 9, and the absolute value of 9 is still 9. So that one is good. We know x is 3 is a possible answer. Now as for negative 3, we have to do the same thing. We're going to go absolute value of 3 times negative 3, and we want to check to see if that's going to be equal to 9. Well, 3 times negative 3 is going to give us the absolute value of negative 9, and the absolute value of negative 9 is positive 9. So that means this here, x is negative 3, is also a positive, uh, or rather a possible answer. So we could have x is positive 3, or we could have x is negative 3 in this question. So the next one we're going to do here is question 2b. This time our absolute value is kind of hidden within the equation, so we're going to get that all by itself first. So we're going to have 5 times the absolute value of 4x plus 10 equals 5. Then we want to get this absolute value all by itself, so let's start by minusing, uh, minusing 10 rather on both sides. This is going to give us 5, 4x, absolute value of 4x equals negative 5. Then we need to divide both sides by 5. That gives us the absolute value of 4x equals negative 1. But here's where we have to stop. Notice it says the absolute value of 4x is negative 1. Well, the absolute value always turns whatever's inside of it into a positive number. Because we have absolute value of 4x is negative 1, this is not going to be possible. So we just have to say that there is no solution. So jumping ahead to question 2d now, uh, our absolute value is all by itself here, so we can just set this up making two equations, one positive, one negative. So we can write this as 3x plus 3 equals 2x minus 5, kind of like what we had been given here. But then the other equation will take 3x plus 3, and that's going to equal the negative version of this, which is going to be negative 2x plus 5. Five. So we just change the sign on each individual piece here to make it negative 2x plus 5. Now let's solve each of these separately. We'll do the first one uh, here first. So we'll minus 2x on both sides to get x plus 3 equals negative 5. And then we can minus 3 on both sides to get x is negative 8. 
For this one, similarly, we can add 2x on both sides to get 5x plus 3 equals positive 5, and then minus 3 on both sides to get 5x equals 2, and then of course divide by 5, it's going to give us x is 2 over 5. But again, with absolute value, whenever you have uh, two different answers, you absolutely must check both of those uh, answers that you were given by plugging it into the original equation. So I just cleared the page just to check our equations now. Remember we had x is negative 8 and x is 2 over 5. Plug both of those back into the original equation you were given. So we're going to plug both of them into absolute value of 3x plus 3 equals 2x minus 5. We'll start by plugging this one in first. This is going to be absolute value of 3 times negative 8, which is negative 24 plus 3. And we want to make sure that's going to be equal to 2 times negative 8, which is negative 16 minus 5. Well, if we go negative 23 plus or negative 24 plus 3, that's going to give us absolute value of negative 21. And if we go negative 16 minus 5, that's going to give us negative 21. But the absolute value of negative 21 is positive 21. So we would have 21 equals negative 21, which is not true. So that tells us right there that this here is not an answer. So now we're going to have to check to see if x is uh, equal to 2 over 5. This very possibly could be our answer here. So we're going to put this into both sides of the equation, just like we did this one. Uh, this is going to be 3 times 2 over 5, which is 6 over 5, plus 3 equals 2 times 2 over 5, which is going to be 4 over 5, minus 5. Well, right off the bat here, I can tell um, we have to add these two pieces together here, but of course we'd have to have matching denominators. But before I even do that, 2 times 4 over 5... Um, okay, so for the next step, we're going to have to check to see if x is equal to 2 over 5. Just take that and plug that into the equation you had as well. So 3 times 2 over 5 is 6 over 5 plus 3 equals 2 times 2 over 5, which is 4 over 5, minus 5. Now in order to add these together, we're going to have to make sure they have the same denominator. Same with these ones over here, but I can tell you right now, um, we don't even have to do it that way, because if we see 4 over 5, 4 over 5 is 0 0.8, and if we go 0 0.8 minus 5, we're going to get something like negative 4.2. Definitely a negative number at very least. So we would have absolute value of whatever these two things here combined are equals negative 4.2. But you can't have the absolute value of something equal a negative number, kind of like we saw in question B. So we can already tell right now that this is also not a possible answer whatsoever. So there is no solution in this question. It's very possible we can have questions that don't end up having solutions. They are uncommon, but you have to check both of your answers. And that really illustrates why it's important. Sometimes one answer works, Sometimes the other answer works, but also sometimes neither of the answers we get will work. Now, just to be absolutely certain that this question, question 3D, doesn't actually have, or 2D, sorry, doesn't actually have any solutions, um, the one way we can tell for absolutely sure is by putting it into our graphing calculator. So we need to graph both the left side and the right side in the graphing calculator and see if they ever meet. If they ever meet, that means there is a solution, but given the math that we did on it just earlier, I don't believe there is going to be any solution, but let's just check to be sure. So if we're going to graph this, we can go y equals, and then into y1, we're going to put that first equation on the left there. Now just a reminder, to do absolute value, you're going to press math, and then go over to number, and then where it says abs, which is just number one right here, that means absolute value, so just press enter. So then it sets up your absolute value, so then you're just going to plug in 3x plus 3, so 3x plus 3 close off the brackets, and then we're going to move down and plug in the right side of the equation, which is just 2x minus 5. So 2x minus 5. Once we graph it, and my window is just set to the standard, that's the absolute value equation, and that is the 2x uh, minus 5 on the right-hand side there. If you look carefully at their slopes, you're going to see that the slope of the absolute value 1 is much steeper than the slope of this other one. So this means this is never actually going to cross the path of this line. In other words, there is no solution and we were right in our answer. Okay, so we're going to skip question 3, although I can just briefly explain. When you graph um, the absolute value of a function, just remember it never drops below the x-axis. So you can very simply sketch the graph of these just by drawing a line this way on this one 
and then making a line come up like this on this one. So pretty much just flip anything that was below the x-axis and you're going to get those answers no problem. We are however going to do question 4. Um, question 4 part A is a little bit on the simple side. I think I'm going to skip and only do question 4 part B. Uh, the absolute value of negative x squared plus 4. To graph uh, this kind of a function, just notice it's a quadratic, so it's going to take the form of a parabola. There's a negative in front of the x squared, which means it's going to be facing downwards. And then that plus 4 is going to tell us that's where our y-intercept is going to be. So if we use our graph, we have a graph here on the back, we can say that this is going to be our y-axis. And this is going to be our x-axis. And remember, if we are going to graph negative x squared plus 4, we know our vertex is going to be at the point 0, positive 4, because our y-intercept is given to us by that plus 4 on the end there. So we'll say this is 1, 2, 3, 4. That's going to be our vertex right there. And then we can follow our 1, 4, 9 rule that we've learned in class for graphing uh, quadratic functions. So remember, it's a downwards facing function because this is uh, an x squared, which means, or a negative x squared, I should say. So there's a negative in front, which means it's going to be downward facing. Um, so to do our 1, 4, 9 rule, just remember we're going to go right 1 and then down 1 times a. Well, a in this case is just negative 1, so that means we're going down 1 times negative 1, which is negative 1. So we're going to go 1 to the right, 1 down. Now the next part, the 4 part of the 1, 4, 9 rule, means we're going to go right 2 spaces and then down 4 times x. So 4 times negative 1 here, which means we're going to go down 1, 2, 3, 4. Last part of the 1, 4, 9 rule is, of course, 9, which means we go over 1, 2, 3 spaces. And then we have to go down 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9 spaces. So again, over 3, 1, 2, 3, and then down 9 spaces to about right here. Now, of course, I'm being a little sloppy with my graph. If you use actual graph paper, try to be a little bit more accurate. My graph, of course, the spots are very, very small, and doing this accurately would be uh, quite difficult, especially for you to see on camera, but still, you get the idea. Try to be as accurate as you possibly can. Now, again, we've only drawn one half of the graph, so draw another half of the graph here. And then we'd connect this with a line, but just remember, we're actually finding the absolute value of this function, which means we're never actually going to be dropping below our x-axis. So only draw the part that's above the x-axis, and then the part that would usually go below the x-axis, we just need to flip and mirror it above the x-axis. So instead of going down like this, we're going to actually follow a roughly similar path by making it go up like so. Okay, so question number five is asking us to express the absolute value function as a piecewise function. In order to do that, we have to look at where the stuff within the absolute value bars would be greater than or equal to zero. That's going to give us a benchmark so we can actually solve uh, how we're going to set up our piecewise function. So, all you need to do is just take the stuff that was in the absolute value bars, so x minus three, and set it greater than or equal to zero, and just solve this inequality, which we can just do by adding three on both sides, which means x must be greater than or equal to 3. Now to set up a piecewise function, notice that if x was greater than or equal to 3, the stuff inside the absolute value bars is always going to be bigger than 0. In other words, the absolute value would have absolutely no effect on this because the number was already positive. So, we are going to say y equals, and a piecewise function was set up using a split apart piece like this, so y is just going to equal x minus 3, no absolute value necessary, when x is greater than or equal to 3. Now as for the other part of the piecewise function, when x was not greater than or equal to 3, your function is not going to equal this, but remember it's going to equal negative 1 times this. If we times this whole thing by negative 1, we're going to get negative x plus 3. So our y is going to equal x minus 3 when x is greater than or equal to positive 3, but our y is actually going to equal negative x plus 3 
when x is less than 3. Because again, if x was less than 3, remember we have to make this positive. So for example, if x was 0, uh, if we put 0 minus 3 into our original equation, that would give us negative 3. And the absolute value of negative 3 is positive 3, so that would not work. But if x was 0, which falls into this category, then you would use this equation instead, which would be negative 0, well just 0, plus 3, which is positive 3, which is actually what our answer would be. So a piecewise function is just another way of expressing an absolute value function, just so that you don't have the absolute value bars around your original thing. This one up now. Question number 6 is asking us to sketch these two graphs. What I want you to notice right away is that this graph right here is the reciprocal of our original one right here. Let's graph the original one first because it's going to be a little bit easier. y equals x plus 1. Notice that our slope, the number in front of the x, is just a 1 and our y-intercept is also 1. So our y-intercept, and I've already done a graph for us right here as soon as it focuses, our y-intercept is just going to be positive 1. So we'll put a dot there. And then the rise over run, or in other words the slope, is just 1. So we go up 1 over 1, up 1 over 1, up 1 over 1, uh, and we can even go backwards, so back one, down one, back one, down one, etc. And just graph that with as straight of a line as we realistically can get here. So, this is the graph of our original function. We want to be able to graph uh, our reciprocal function here. In order to graph a reciprocal function, we need two things in mind. We need to find something called the vertical asymptote. And the vertical asymptote is just the dotted line that our function cannot uh, touch. So in other words, what we have to do is we have to take a look at our original function and we have to see where that original function is equal to zero. Well, it's equal to zero right at this point right here. In other words, our x-intercept. So in our reciprocal function, because this is where our original graph equals zero, in our reciprocal function, that is where we would be accidentally dividing by zero. And of course, we don't want to be dividing by zero. That's why a vertical asymptote exists. Uh, because we can't touch that point. It's going to be a point that we can't touch because otherwise we'd be dividing by zero. So let's just put a dotted line straight up and straight down from that x-intercept. So we found our vertical asymptote, but another important thing we need to have is our invariant points. And the invariant points always occur at y equals 1 and y equals negative 1. Well, this line is touching y, uh, y is 1 at this point right here and it's also touching y is negative 1 at this point right here. What these points are telling us is that is going to be where our function is going to cross through. Um, it's very important to have those points um, because then we actually have a common uh, point between our original line as well as our reciprocal. Now, what's often difficult is figuring out, okay, well where is our reciprocal function actually going to go? Well, because our original function is negative down here, that means our reciprocal function also has to be negative down here. Now in Math 20, our reciprocal function is always going to have a horizontal asymptote, kind of like a vertical asymptote, but a horizontal asymptote equal to the x-axis. So it's always going to shoot off towards the x-axis. Sometimes it's just hard to figure out, well, where is it going to be? Well, in this case, since we have our invariant points, this point and this point, uh, and we have a vertical asymptote, and this part is positive, we can be sure that our reciprocal is going to look something like this. So remember, it shoots off towards our vertical asymptote here and shoots down towards our horizontal asymptote here, but it also passes through this invariant point. Same is going to happen down here. We're going to start at our horizontal asymptote, cross through our invariant point, and then down towards our vertical asymptote. So again, this is our original line, and this is the equation, or is rather the graph of our reciprocal. The only other thing the question was asking was state the invariant points. Well, just state the coordinates that you can see on your graph of your invariant points. The coordinate of this point right here is, of course, 0, 1. And the coordinate of this one right here is negative 2, negative 1. So that wraps up absolute value and reciprocal functions. Um, question number seven is very similar to the one we just did, but just notice it's a quadratic rather than a linear function. So you're actually going to end up having two separate uh, vertical asymptotes, but the same general principle is going to apply.